Um, for those of you that are watching or watching and catch up, this is the second part of um, our Dementia webinar series, um, a system-wide um, project, which will be hosted on um, Kerno Health CIC uh, YouTube channel. Um, delighted today to be joined by Jodie Lay, um, Dementia Liaison Lead, if I get your title yeah, right, and um, Sally Thomas, <coughs> who's one of our consultant psychiatrists. Yeah. So this uh, second part leads on, it's from the first, uh, leads on from the first uh, series, and basically we're focusing around dementia. Um, basically so we we're thinking about the three D's we mentioned those at the end of the last one when you're thinking about the differential diagnosis of dementia we think about the three D's depression drugs and alcohol and delirium they're the three things to kind of rule out when you're considering a diagnosis of dementia so without further ado I'll hand over to our speakers today who are going to do a focus mostly on delirium Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Um, so, yeah, do we do we need the, the slides up there now? Um, yeah, we we work with a, a psychiatric liaison team in RCHT. So, differential diagnosis is is very much part of our our <coughs> bread and butter in in practice. Um, and so the, the real objectives of the, the webinar today are to look at, as Alison said, differential diagnosis. So what is delirium and how does it differ from, from dementia? Um, why it's important, um, because there's a very much a two-way um, street between delirium and dementia. What the causes might be in terms of identifying what might be sort of treatable and reversible. Um, and what might present a risk to, to your patients in terms of developing it, who's vulnerable to, to delirium. We'll briefly touch on um, depression as, as another differential in those three Ds um, with some management tips at the end. So delirium's uh, something that, that um, comes on very suddenly and it's characterised by uh, a, a person having an altered conscious state. So by that we mean that they find it difficult to attend or to focus um, and also to perhaps shift attention from, from one situation to another. Um, and that will tend to fluctuate during the course of uh, an encounter with that person or the course of a day. Um, they often, often also have some issues with um, perception. So by that we mean they might have abnormal um, perceptions, hallucinations, either visual or, or auditory, and they might misinterpret things in their surroundings, objects around them, and they will very often have a disturbance in their cognitive function. Disorientation is a, is a big problem, um, and they'll also have no memory for the episode in, in question. Why it's important is it's a really serious condition, um, it's, uh, it's linked very closely with dementia um, and it's associated in our patients with very poor outcomes. Uh, and there's work that can be done to prevent it, um, both to prevent it happening in the first place, but also to prevent it becoming much more of a serious challenge if it's managed effectively. So it's really important to get that early, early assessment, identification and, and a kind of treatment plan in place. Um, just a bit more of a sort of expansion on what the core features are but I think we've really kind of focused on those already. Obviously the big question is whether there is evidence there to support a, a physical health problem um, and that's something that can be quite challenging particularly in a frail older person and particularly in someone who already has a dementia um, because a very small insult can often produce quite profound delirium um, so it's really important to always bear it in mind, even if you can't find significant health issues. So it's important because we've got an ageing population and it's important because older people um, find themselves in hospital um, very often and, and they're, they're a, a large population of, of those present in, in the acute hospital, sometimes avoiding uh, hospital admission in, in, in patients with delirium might actually provide better outcomes. 
Um, as about 30% of, of hospital beds will have a person suffering with delirium um, in them. And as I said before, there's this very important two-way relationship between delirium. So people who have delirium, uh, who have dementia are vulnerable to delirium. And people who develop delirium um, will very often go on to, um, to develop a dementia. So in one quite recent study, we're talking about one in three um, patients in a cohort studied who um, had delirium in, in hospital and followed up a year post-discharge um, had developed um, dementia. Um, people will stay in hospital longer when they suffer from delirium um, and they'll also be much more likely to die as a result of that acute illness. That's about three to five times more likely to die as a result. And I think the other important thing in terms of community practice is that these patients will have a very large increase in the rate at which they need um, more um, dependent care settings, so institutionalisation for want of another other term. So someone with a delirium in their home setting um, may, may end up, if that's not managed appropriately, requiring residential nursing care in, in future. Um, there's also some links with um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So the experience is extremely distressing for people. Um, they often uh, recall some of the, 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 the kind of hallucinations and, and odd ideas they have um, rather than um, the hospital stay itself. So it can be problematic. So it's now time for a um, bit of interaction from you, either in the room or, or on the screen. Um, so we're asking you a question. So um, how many other names for delirium can you come up with? So what, what have you heard families um, or carers describe delirium to you as? Sometimes pleasantly, I have her term pleasantly confused quite a bit, Jodie. Yeah, absolutely. Which I always wonder why, because certainly no confusion is pleasant. No, <laughs> not very pleasant for the person. No, no, so I never understand that unpleasantly. <laughs> yes. Pleasantly yeah. confused. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so obviously confused, um, cute confusional state. I think these are probably sort of, you would hear this more of a, a medical term, away with the fairies um, and off legs, um, organic <coughs> psychosis, UTI. I don't know if anyone else can think of of any others, but I'm sure that we've all all have plenty yeah. in our time. I think acute confusion gets used a lot. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that we mean delirium. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's misunderstood, isn't it? Yes. Definitely. So um, there is a diagnostic criteria for um, delirium. Um, so we were thinking we'd be thinking about um, changes to somebody's attention. Um, and this would be an acute change, so something that had happened in the last few days rather than if we're thinking about dementia, then we're looking obviously a huge amount longer, so months um, or years. But this is really acute, maybe in the last sort of two weeks or days. They would have a disturbance to, to their cognition, so be quite disorientated. Their language might have been affected, visual spatial problems it might be... So they're knocking into things if they're they're walking through doorways perhaps and their perception would have would have changed so as sally alluded to so quite often people's perception of a situation or circumstance that they're in somebody might experience hallucinations or or delusions um, there's also um direct sort of psychological consequences um, and can be linked to other medical problems. So, yeah, what do what people actually say? Um, I think that's really important, and that's, you know, in, in care home settings, maybe um, you, you'll have people remarking that mum or dad are, are, are different to how they usually are. This isn't mum, she's, she's not behaving how she usually behaves. Um, another kind of uh, reflection might be, well, she, she, she seems fine. You know, I visited her yesterday, yesterday afternoon and she seemed perfectly lucid. We were chatting about um, our granddaughter. Today I've come in and she's, she's very different. She's very muddled. Um, and 
another thing that people often um, remark on is, 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 is sort of paranoid, kind of persecutory, suspicious flavour to, to the way that, that people are talking. So often a, a, a person will be talking about being poisoned, staffing against them, terrible things happening in the middle of the night. Um, quite often that relates to um, their loved ones as well. Quite often they have links to awful things about their, their husband or wife. So people quite often refer to people being in prison um, and recently we had a gentleman um, in hospital who thought his wife was, was buried under the hospital. And actually this can be really distressing, can't it, yeah. For, yeah. for family members. Yeah. Um, quite often people bring in videos of, because they're so shocked at how their loved one is, is presenting. Um, yeah. it's, really, it's really very distressing. Not just for the patient themselves, but also no, for the people around them. Exactly, yeah. and the staff that are yeah. looking after them yeah, and also absolutely. be distressing for them. Um, I think that one of the most common things that we face in our practice is, well, it can't be delirium because actually all the numbers are normal, so every blood test has been done. Um, but we know that, as we were saying before, someone, particularly someone with a vulnerable brain, someone with a, a frail frailty syndrome, will be very vulnerable to delirium and, and that the insult can be really minor um, to produce it. Like the lack of sleep in hospital. Yes, anybody, the bright who's, lights, anybody the who's ever spent a yes. night in hospital, you don't, you know, a lot of people don't actually sleep. Right? No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Changing wards, it might be somebody across the ward is, is making noise or, you know, up all night. We always talk about people that um, don't have their, Sally talks about, you know, losing their false teeth, not having mm. their glasses, hearing yeah. aids, all those things. Yeah. And that's um, really important because that leads us very nicely on to it being a preventable dis condition, so about a third of delirium is preventable. Um, and um, you know, we really need to work very hard to, to try and make sure that that's, that's what we're doing, we're, we're trying to prevent it. So you need to be really aware of risk factors, avoiding those, um, and, um, and, and just being aware of how the interaction between risk factors and, and other conditions can actually um, come together to produce a delirium um, and we've, we've said several times and you must you must, must remember that that it's really important um, to 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 remember that in a person who's frail or has already has dementia a very small insult can cause um, a delirium so th this is something that's been taken from um, the uh, social care institute of excellence recommendations to staff in care homes around delirium prevention so very much sort of community setting focused um, and prevention comes from making sure that the person is orientated so um, having a daily newspaper would allow them to be able to, to sort of look at what the day is but you could also use clocks calendars that kind of thing so big boards in 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 kind of um, lounges in care homes that actually um, remind the person what day it is and perhaps some of the activities that are going on that day. We quite often use, in people's homes, we quite often use whiteboards as well just to you know, put the date mm. on, see if a carer is going in, they can put that in big letters so people are quite orientated. Mm. Yeah, and say what's happening to that person yeah. that day, so yeah. they've they got yeah. some structure. Um, sensory aids really important, so if someone wears a hearing aid or has their spectacles, absolutely they must have those at all time. In, in, in hospital, acute hospital settings, what often happens is that the, the family member is so worried that they might lose those um, things that they, um, they take them home with them and that's a surefire way to, to kind of make sure someone develops a delirium. See, making sure someone's hydrated, well nourished, keeping a check on their bowels, um, dentures are another thing. People must have their teeth and they must be clean and, and, and fitting. Um, pain is another big issue, um, particularly in our, our sort of um, population. So assessing for pain and making sure it's adequately managed. Um, the, other, the other important thing is actually making sure that people are mobile. So mm -hmm. making sure that there's an opportunity to um, to wander, to walk about, um, and if exercise is difficult, actually providing some sort of support with, with that as required. Um, and as we said, good sleep hygiene, so sleeplessness is a big factor. Um, and when people maybe move into an institution, there's a lot more sort of noise and disruption 
um, and they might get woken up for kind of weird and wonderful um, reasons in the middle of the night so perhaps to check on them and make sure they're okay but we should really avoid that as much as possible to make sure someone's able to sleep through the night and obviously sleep you don't sleep if you haven't had a nice busy productive day with with some exercise and um and, and some purposeful activity so sort of routine almost yeah yeah now that's really useful i think we often forget about actually preventing delirium yes. i think there's a lot of focus on oh, what yes. we do to yes. sort it out now it's yeah. happened yeah. actually i think that's yeah i think that is really useful yeah so yeah. Think about it. yeah i mean this we, we that's the sort of health service has been structured very much in the reactive rather than the proactive yeah. kind of way, hasn't it? So as Sally already leads to um, talking about some of the risk factors, so usually the, the type of person that's going to experience a del delirium is normally older in age. Um, <clears throat> so that's a risk in itself. Not everyone that we see with the delirium has a cognitive impairment, but if you've already experiencing a degree of, of memory problems or indeed dementia, then that is indeed another risk factor. And also people present themselves that much worse and sometimes slower to resolve. Um, Post-surgery. So quite often the team, um, it's happening more frequently now, I think, are actually consulted pre-surgery and starting to consider if this person does have a cognitive impairment or whether or not they've experienced a delirium before, actually let's think about how we're going to approach that pre-surgery so that post-surgery they've got the wraparound care that they need. Pain, Sally already says, pain is, is a big one and it's really, especially if somebody is already experiencing a dementia, it's talking to those people around them, understanding the non-verbal signs that might be signifying that somebody's in pain. Are they rubbing their knee or their foot or their hip? Um, or are they, they, they shouting when you move them? Those sorts of things, because um, not everyone can tell us whether or not they're in pain. Considering their medication, so is all the medication that they're on necessary? Because um, often it's not. And we know that some medications interact and can cause a delirium. Um, renal impairment and hepatic impairment, and also drug and alcohol withdrawal. Very often we receive referrals within the team for people that are experiencing a cognitive impairment, but actually only two weeks prior they were consuming large amounts of alcohol. Um, Surgery, we've all discussed, significant environmental changes. So we really don't want to be moving these people. We get referrals for people that have moved wards the day prior, they're living with dementia, and, and then their cognitive impairment is significantly increased. Um, so that is a, hu a huge one. And I guess in a sort of community setting, in a nursing home type setting, if that's maybe where sort of GPs and community staff are going to it might be just because there have been there's been some building work or the person's yeah. had to move room to accommodate a, another resident or Absolutely. or um or there's sort of disruptions just well, generally I guess, yeah. I guess if you're assessing for um cognition you want to let somebody settle into the care home if they've come Absolutely. straight out of a yeah. hospital yeah. that's not mm -hmm. you know the day after arrival mm -hmm. is not the day yeah. to be considering yeah. whether they've got dementia you yeah. need to leave them Absolutely. Settle in a bit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and also sensory impairment. So not having your hearing aid in your glasses um, can be a huge risk factor for developing a delirium. So precipitating factors. So infection, um, as we've already said, quite often it's about whether or not um, infection markers are, are raised in the blood results. Um, and if they're not, they haven't got delirium, but that, that isn't. That isn't the case. Um, and sometimes you might even need to wait wait a day. Somebody might be really presenting really quite drastically different to, to their norm. Um, and quite often you just get that gut feeling, and they we do, um, do the blood the next day and actually they've got a raging infection. Um, so it's just, it's just about being considering, I think, all the facts and making sure that we're taking an adequate history as well. Um, 
drugs so what drugs are they on are they interacting is any new medication been recently started immobility I mean, just going back to drugs, that's uh, obviously a, something that, that GPs will be in, involved in, in reviewing on a regular basis. And yeah. I know that, that the pharmacists are very good at, at, at producing a whole list of drugs that have anticholinergic burden. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we rely on that when we're going around the world. But things like amitriptylin, promazine, um, some of the, the drugs for, for um, urinary um, frequency and continence, so oxybutynin, tolteridine, those are the sort of big ones that you need to look out for. But um, just reviewing that um, is, is really important. Obviously, opiates for pain. So you've got someone who's in pain, but you, which you need to manage, but you have to be slightly careful about the drugs uh, that you choose to, to do that. Um, it's all about balance in the end. Mm, absolutely. Um, so having a catheter in, I, I, I think globally those the, the, the bladder and, and the constipation linked together to just making sure that people have had their bowels open, they have had a wee, they're drinking enough, they're hydrated, they have eaten, all those basic things that we all know but quite often get get overlooked and I guess in hospital that's easier to monitor but as GPs in the community it's about again about taking that adequate history from the family members pain we've, all, we've, I mean, we've already skirted over I think most of these again a sensory deprivation so making sure that the hearing aid has got a battery in it and their glasses are they st still correct for them just yeah. reviewing all, all of those simple are things are they their glasses yes. Yes. Well, well, or indeed their teeth yes. which yeah, absolutely. Um, which kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i was just going to say as well about there was one on there about the clock so making sure the clock has actually the right time quite often elderly people like to wear a watch making sure that's that's to the right yeah. time as well or indeed yeah. it's working yeah as yeah. a working battery. Yeah. So we thought we'd put together a slide. It's a bit busy, I'm afraid, and probably something that if you're kind of watching on 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 sort of catch up or able to kind of look back on at a later date, you can you can sort of digest uh, at your leisure. Um, but I think the key points are in in sort of um, deciding um, what what you're looking at between the, the 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 three differentials: delirium, dementia, and depression. It's the onset that really is important. So someone who has a sudden onset over hours or days of confusion. Um, probably has a delirium until proven otherwise um, whereas dementia presents much more gradually over months to years and we would always be suggesting that to diagnose dementia really you should be looking at someone with a more than six month history yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of, of memory loss and confusion um, although obviously you will see with dementia as it as it progresses sometimes stepwise decline and that can be because of the diagnosis because it's a vascular type process or it can be just because of intercurrent illness and, and the sort of effects of inflammation um, and, uh, and, and so on on, on the, the dementia course. Depression can be a little bit more difficult to, to sort of unpick, um, but you're, you're not really looking for hours or days in terms of onset, you're looking to weeks and months, and you'd probably be, be identifying um, significant life changes that might have precipitated that um, or perhaps a, a, a past history actually that's really important when you're talking about depression you know someone being prone to depressive episodes throughout their life mm. um, so onset in terms of making that differential diagnosis is really important um, then you've got this really key factor which is attention and concentration so if you're delirious, you don't attend, you don't concentrate, you can't focus on things, you're, you, you're kind of picking at something on the floor, then you might answer a question, then you will go back to picking something on the floor again. Um, whereas in dementia, that sort of, whilst you might not get the right answers to the questions, um, that person will probably be able to attend to, to, yeah. to you and have a, some kind of dialogue with you. They're trying to make sense of it more, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, in depression, well, concentration is poor, that's a kind of feature of the illness. Um, but it has a slightly different flavour to it. It's, um, 
it's not the, the sort of attention is rapidly shifting in delirium whereas in depression it's just generally poor concentration a sort of inability to maintain a focus on a on a discussion um, again sort of memory and orientation um, they can be affected in delirium or dementia but it's really going back to you know how long have these been problematic um, in depression you can get changes in in cognition um, something called depressive pseudo dementia um, again you're going to be expecting to see quite a severe depressive illness if if that's the case and you'll find evidence of, of, of poor concentration and really quite profound sort of mental slowing so when you're talking to someone they just their processing of information and their responses to questions will will take um quite some considerable time um sleep's another thing a way of identifying the problem so um someone with delirium will have mar markedly disturbed sort of sleep wake cycle often sleeping during periods of the day and then being up all night and and, and kind of causing mayhem very often when when particularly in care home settings and hospital settings, there are fewer staff around. Um, dementia people tend to get into a can get into a pattern of day night reversal, um, but it's not an acute feature of, of the illness really. Um, and with depression, you get that very classic um, early morning wakening. So waking a couple of hours before someone's routine would normally be to wake up, or being very sleepy and wanting to kind of just sleep in, on, on, on the sofa all day. So the sundowning, that relates, yeah. that when people talk yeah, about that, yeah, they absolutely. mean mainly the dementia, don't they? Yeah, yes. yeah that's yeah. a sort of pattern that people yeah. kind yeah. of yeah. establish. Yeah. They just start sort of yeah. waking up. Yeah, just becoming overactive, really, mm. at, at a certain part of the day. So usually around four or five o'clock and going on through into the evening. Um, yeah, increasingly busy. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas actually you'll see you'll see variation in that in someone with delirium throughout the day in terms okay. of their kind of motor behaviour really. Okay. Um yeah, so and let's not dwell on this too much, but refer to that. It's a really kind of useful table if you're trying to make differentials. Um We've we've also got um, some ideas about how to to um, use screening tools to assess for the three Ds, um, and we've got those listed there. So um, CAM and 4AT, um, again, we've got the links there. They're very helpful. Sort of three or four question screening tools for delirium, um, and whilst they they're screening tools you do have to be careful so you've got to have the screening tool and the, cl the clinical information really in order to be making a diagnosis but they'll be raising your suspicions yeah, okay. about what the problem is um i think most certainly, certainly the cam i think as nurses we find helps to justify yeah um what we're saying yeah um, they use they use the cam as a as a so on they've got um orthogeriatric input onto the um, trauma wards for um, fractured necks of femur, which is a big risk for delirium. And they use the CAM preoperatively and then postoperatively mm -hmm. to look for change. And we're trying to introduce the 4A team more widely in the hospital. But it, you know, it's a useful tool generally in the community as well. Okay. Um, dementia, these are things that I'm sure GPs are familiar with and you might have covered in the previous yeah. um, talk. Um, and depression, again, probably familiar with these, but uh, the PHQ-9 is something that we were looking to use in hospital to screen for depression, but there's a PHQ-2 as well, which is just the first two, two questions of the PHQ-9. Yeah, I think we're quite um, familiar with PHQ-9. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, that's a good, good kind of way to, to be... So just add into your differential process. So there's four different types of, of categories for, for delirium. Um, and we just thought it'd be useful to, to discuss some of those presentations because it is really hard to, to diagnose delirium and to go between them, I think particularly with, with when you're considering depression as well. Um, so the hyperactive delirium is probably one of the more the easier ones, I would say. Um, so the person would be restless, agitated, um, 
so by agitated we're meaning they're walking around they're picking up things they're helpless they don't really know what to do they can't sit down they're moving all the time um, and distressed I guess can be really quite physically aggressive um, and I think that's something that can be really quite distressing for families especially if that person hasn't had any degree of memory problems before so to suddenly see your loved one um, you know sometimes for the need even for restraint certainly in, in the acute setting pacing rapid mood changes so one minute sitting down and absolutely fine and the next minute they could be throwing a punch yeah or very, somebody up against them yeah very labile sometimes yeah. cheerful as well yeah. and kind of really sort of um, very distressed and visibly upset um yeah absolutely um and within that, sometimes, especially as people are coming out, I think that's more more often that lability because sometimes they can they have some insight as well, so yes. they can understand yeah. that what why is this happening to me and so disturbed sleep. So quite often sleepy in the day, but then and you think all is well, and then actually at night really causing these problems and that's quite often when these behaviors we've discussed quite often. yeah and i think these were off so these are this is a group of patients with delirium that will come to our attention yeah. so you almost you don't have to worry quite so much about these people because the staff in a care home or the yeah. family at home will be saying you know this this is going on and it's really difficult what's going what's happening yeah. whereas the 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 person with a hypoactive delirium will be lying quietly yeah. in bed mm -hmm. And they get missed, and um, so they're probably associated with a, a, a higher morbid morbidity and mortality because um, the, the the problem isn't uh, assessed and managed as quickly. Sometimes they look like they they are dying, but actually, yeah. if you don't exclude the reversible, mm -hmm. you know, you can go from somebody mm -hmm. hyperactive delirium mm -hmm. who looks mm -hmm. they look like they're yes. kind of dying, and then yes. and then you kind of warn the family, and then yes. you yeah. give some antibiotics or fluids and the next day they're sat bolt up right yeah, yeah. yeah. Think, wow yes. what, a, exactly. what a change yeah. actually so, and it yeah. can also be confused with with depression as well because mm. these are people who are looking quite withdrawn mm. apathetic um and um and so it can be um confused with a severe depression mm. but it's about identifying a, a, an underlying treatable cause so then um acute and chronic so delirium with somebody who's already living with dementia. Um, so really quite quite difficult to assess, especially if it's the first time you've met them, trying to understand what their baseline is. Um, usually a rapid onset. Again, these are probably the people that, that come to our attention because probably their behaviour is causing those that are caring for them some difficulty. Um, it exacerbates any underlying deficit so everything is that much worse um, and it can be a really ch big challenge can't it for yeah. people that yeah. are yeah. caring for them yeah and i think the big issue here is that um someone with a delirium on top of their dementia um will very often become much more dependent so they'll their, their dementia deteriorates yeah. their cognitive problems are are, are um are greater as a result of that insult and they never fully recover yeah. um, so preventing it, it is really important in and that group. I think that's difficult for the families isn't it? I can mm. think of a, mm. a handful of recent cases where we're trying to get that person back to where they were especially if that person was living at home mm. and then you've got that that deterioration hasn't hasn't quite come back and then then they they may need 24-hour care that's again really very distressing yeah. for that that loved one. Yeah. And then slow resolving delirium. Um, so I think quite often, um, certainly in the, the acute setting, and most probably in primary care as well, it's it's what to do with these people. So where do these people go where whilst this resolution is happening, I guess. Um, so in the acute setting, we have step down beds now actually into residential care, um, which is quite quite helpful. And I imagine in the community home first, um, they monitor these patients, so that could be a resource that you possibly use. Um, 
so often these people are, are more likely to be living with a dementia um, and I guess that could be diagnosed or undiagnosed because actually a large proportion of the people certainly we see in the acute setting I think 50 percent um, although they've been likely to be living with dementia for some time actually they don't have a diagnosis um, yeah, and I think this is really important and something that, that is probably really important to think about in, in general practice is that this is a group that um, may or may not have been diagnosed. It's very difficult to make a diagnosis of dementia in the context of someone who we know has had a delirium, but we don't know that they've definitely had a dementia before. But in order to put in place some of those um, preventative measures, and also some of the other stuff that it's important to, to have in place when, when you have a diagnosis. Actually, we need to be monitoring this group of people and, and to be assessing cognition somewhere down the line to see if they, they have gone on to develop dementia. So this is a really important so they, group. Sometimes they need more than one assessment, yeah. really. You need to sort Absolutely. of need to follow up, give them time. Because yeah. kind of often thing. it can take some, some months. I mean up to four or five months and actually it's really important to have that consistency mm. of reviewing because quite often the improvement can be really quite small um, mm. but there is some improvement and certainly this is one of I think one of the challenges that we certainly mm. face yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. How we make it? sure that people like this don't fall through yeah. the net really and, and the holes in, in, in the system mm. um, and actually get the, the diagnosis that they they need in order to yeah to put some of that sort of preventive stuff in place. Yeah, and I think sometimes you talk in terms of, I think about rehabilitation. Mm. We kind of think about somebody's physical kind of well-being, kind of recovering. But yeah. I don't think it's always recognised that actually they need time for their delirium to yeah, sort of settle yeah. its kind of yeah. mind and body, yeah. isn't yes. it, really, when we're yes. talking. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. And I think certainly as GPs, it's useful to um, use and abuse your dementia liaison service who go into the care homes because... Um, we now review people um, experiencing delirium so that we have got that opportunity to review and make sure that we don't miss diagnosing some of these folks. So it's, yeah. it's really good to, yeah. to tap into your, your DLM, which you will, you will all have one. I think in terms of the memory assessment service, they like a, a, a period of sort of yes. stability after yeah. coming out yeah. of yeah. hospital yeah. for their yeah. sort of assessment, yeah. usually at least yeah. four weeks to kind of let everything the dust settle yes. to kind of then kind of... Yes. And also I think it's quite often, especially if the delirium is going to resolve, quite often um, the type of care that, that person might need is a dementia nursing home. And actually the reason also for reviewing it is because if they come out of that, they are then they don't need they're, they're in, right. then yeah. they're in this environment in which is totally unsuitable for so, them yeah. 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 yeah yeah so it's just that kind of allowing for the sort of uncertainty yeah really. absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean in some in some it, there's, a, there's a very good program that we're quite interested in in west hertfordshire where they they have what they call a delirium recovery program um, and that's actually very rapid um, input and assessment of patients presenting to hospital with delirium who are then within 24 to 48 hours um, discharged back into the community with, with regular review and occupational therapy input. Um, and that's about that kind of um, rehabilitation, both mm -hmm. cognitive and physical rehabilitation, and also an opportunity to review the diagnosis mm -hmm. later down the line. Mm -hmm. And actually, what they see with that program is is um, that the, whilst they might have predicted this group of patients would go into institutional mm -hmm. care, um, a significant proportion, probably something like seventy five percent of these people, stay in their own homes. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, this is just a bit of a recap on what we've already been talking about, really. So just remembering that de dementia and delirium frequently occur together and it's difficult to distinguish them. But we've kind of given you some tips about how you might do that. Um, this notion of only requiring relatively minor insults, physical insults to become delirious when you've already got dementia or are frail. Um, and... Um, the worsening of, of of cognitive impairment that happens during an episode of, of delirium, there may or may not be recovery from that. Um, so assume that someone presenting with acute confusion has delirium until you can prove otherwise. And I just think by doing that, we're putting in place the right assessment yeah. processes and potential treatments.
So causes of delirium, we've already sort of touched on these in terms of risk and precipitating factors, but can we sort of recap on some of those? Um, drugs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Pain. Yeah. yeah. Change of environment. Yeah, constipation. Sensory loss. Urine, loads, problems, urine infections. Metabolic problems. Yeah, so low sodium. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they use, we use a lovely mnemonic called oh, Kids Me. Um, so that crops up in a lot of delirium yeah. policy okay. documents. So these are just some, some kind of broad um, things to think about yeah. um, and gives you the mnemonic pinch me. I like the slogan can... pretty much anything. That's yeah. true, isn't it? It is pretty <laughs> much anything, yeah. Um, can be difficult to convince people that pretty Absolutely. much anything can, but yeah. it, it really can. Um, and I think, again, that's where the, the use of the can becomes yeah. extremely yeah. Um, valuable. Yeah. So I mean, you can see it's so a pain, infection, constipation, hydration, medication, environment. Uh, we touched on these things already. So just a little bit of a think about why it happens. And I mean, I'm not going to tell you about brain sort of chemistry and neuroinflammation because um, I, I don't think we really need to know about that in depth. But there does seem to be some complex interaction between the inflammatory response and perhaps changes in the blood-brain barrier as we age or as a result of insults such as dementia, stroke and so on. Um, pretty picture of the blood-brain barrier there but it's a, it's a privileged place where normally toxins and, and so on can't, can't cross to affect brain tissue but um, unfortunately what seems to happen in the process of delirium is that that is in some way impacted and and, in, and, and, and we get the, the effects of toxins and so on um, directly onto the brain itself. So management. So, so find a treatable cause. So again, taking a, a really good history, both medical and social, what's been happening in the last two weeks um, and obviously taking your, your bloods and things like this. You need to consider the legal framework. Does this person have mental capacity? Very often they, they don't. And I think that can be a real challenge in a care home setting yes. because staff worry quite a lot about what they can um, what they can sort of I suppose enforce in terms of, of treatment yeah. and things on, on, a, on a person thinking about something like covert medication a person who's delirious but needs antibiotics for an infection but won't won't take them because they're suspicious yeah could use covert medication um, under the Mental Capacity Act to, to allow um, medication to be dispensed. But we've got to be very clear about those frameworks so that staff feel supported. Yeah, we're um, going to I think we're going to cover, we're going to put yeah. Nikki Brown coming yeah, later right. in the series yeah. actually to do yeah. a talk on some of the legal yeah. frameworks because I think it, it is yeah. an important area and it's, it's sometimes very yeah. misunderstood. And yeah. certainly the document, certainly in care homes, the documentation of that to make sure that's all, yeah. uh, all accurate. So when you're, when you're doing that assessment, also just do an assessment of mental capacity to make decisions about the treatment that's required and then you can be advising the care home staff that that treatment can be carried out in in the best interest of the patient under the MCA sometimes deprivation of liberty safeguards are, are required as well with an authorization for dolls mm -hmm. but as Alison alluded it sounds like that's going to be covered in more detail yeah, than one of the other area to come yeah that's great. yeah so considering considering the risks and usually that's that can be around behaviours that challenge, but also it can be around things like lack of hydration, um, bowels, those those physical elements. Um, but certainly in relation to challenging behaviours, starting to think about, I guess, recording those adequately, understanding what the triggers might be, and also understanding that person. So understanding who they are, what their likes and dislikes are, what their histories are. Um, certainly in the acute setting and also care homes, we use the This Is Me tool, which is really designed for somebody living with dementia. Um, and you can actually download it off the Alzheimer's Society website. Um, it looks very pretty if you download it in colour. <laughs> um, but you as a GP could give that to the families to document the person's story so then certainly when you're 
you're looking after that person either in a care home or in the acute setting or maybe even in their own home actually that gives you a little bit of a tool for orientation um, the other tool that's quite useful is actually to to have a diary of what's been happening so writing down conversations that you might have had with that person um, people that have visited them so actually you can try at, certainly as they come out of the delirium to orientate them um, so and make sense of some of those experiences yeah, as well absolutely. yeah yeah um, I mean, the, I think what Jodie's sort of focusing on is, is that actually most management can be without medication. Yeah, um, so you can, you, you know, you can manage a lot of the risks and distress and the challenging behaviour without medicine with the right sort of yeah. nursing, um, nursing care. Um, but sometimes you do have to resort to, um, to, to, to medicine, to sedative medicine, to um, to both alleviate distress, and I think that's really important. It's not just so we can do things to people to make them better. It's actually this mm. whole thing is very distressing for the person. Mm. Um, and, and so it seems only right sometimes to have to intervene um, with, with a sedative. We would advise never using benzodiazepines, particularly in an older, frailer population um, with delirium because they do seem to be deliriogenic. It's a kind of made up word, but they do seem to actually make mm -hmm. delirium worse. Um, so we'd always advise very low dose olanzapine, which we have on our policy here in the hospital. Um, and use judiciously, regularly, for a very short period of time can, can really help that person to, to recover. Um, I think uh, in primary care sometimes we feel nervous about using mm. an antipsychotic mm. medication. So yeah. I, I know when I've used it, I've kind of spoken to you know one of the team, Dementia, kind of yeah, yeah dementia liaison or yeah. one of the yeah. sort of area consultant psychiatrists, just to kind of make sure that yeah. Yeah. prescribing at the right yeah. doses. And yeah, and I guess the, the the sort of geriatric silver line that yeah. would be the kind of advice yeah. that they could give yeah. you for, for managing this. Yeah, in a community setting. So they're very sort of on board with olanzapine as a sort of first line, really, in, 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 in management okay. for, for, from a medical medication point of view. Okay. Um, so then we're thinking about, again, as we're harping on about the sensory aids, the dentures, mm -hmm. everything that that person usually needs to help them. They need it more than ever now. I mean, it's so important. We, we had a gentleman um, on Tuesday who had suffered a severe head injury and he has a background of, of a, a form of dementia. Um, and lots of people had been approaching him, chatting to him, like, you know, what's your name? Where are you? And he'd just been, been making very nonsensical um, yeah. conversation back. But he didn't, his hearing aid batteries weren't working. So it wasn't because he was really, really muddled. It was because he couldn't hear what was being said. So he's got his hearing aid batteries in now, and actually he seems much less cognitively impaired. So it really is important. Yeah, just the simple absolutely. things. Sometimes. It is the simple mm. things. It's mm. not rocket science. And that orientation, so having a big clock on the wall that says the right time and the date, um, having the notepad that tells them the person who's visited, um, when they're coming back, and also having familiar, possible familiar things around them. So. Um, pictures of their loved ones, their favourite book, the music that they like. Um, we often have radios and things brought in. I'm a great fan of pictorial life story books. I think they're great. Um, just something to, to make that person feel comfortable and um, much more orientated. Um, and including activities. So like so says, busying that person, um, not maybe not overly, overly stimulating them, but you know, the usual things that that person might do, or it might be that that person, I don't know, used to be an accountant or they used to be a, a secretary. So giving them a clipboard or a load of yeah. envelopes yeah. or mm, yeah. tea towels or making that person feel useful in a care home, asking them to be involved in um, giving out the teas or just per purposeful. Yeah. Um, and be patient. That's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, and it is in an acute environment. I mean, the other thing that's really important, which is is at the bottom there, is 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 actually involving family. So getting family to, to come to the person and, yeah. and be involved in their care. 
that's both familiarity, so it reduces sort of suspicion and distress, but it, it just it, it does seem to kind of really impact and orientate. Um, and I think as clinicians, quite often we we don't like to ask families to to come in because we're worried about what they might say. It's our job to look after that person. But often this group of of families have really loved, really yeah. worried about their yeah. loved ones because yeah. suddenly yeah. they've changed. Yeah. So actually, more often than not, I mean, we had I remember we had a guy last year that the grandchildren were coming in, the children, the wife, everyone, to spend time with dad and granddad just to help to help him through. Yeah. Um, I think that's the same. Whether they're great. in an acute hospital, community hospital, yeah, or, or a care, care home, home, or even in their yeah. own home, actually, just yeah. the family spending a bit more time than normal than just the care and stopping. Mm -hmm. I mean and there's there's that balance isn't it between actually um, you know that that might swing you towards keeping a person at home or in their mm -hmm. care home setting rather than sending them up to an acute mm -hmm. hospital because actually if you can keep family nearby mm -hmm. that's often really important in terms of recovery whereas it would be more, much more difficult if they're 50 miles up the road. Mm -hmm. um, I think certainly in a care home again it's about trying to keep that person there again using abusing the services that you've got around with you get the dlns in get home first in so that we don't have to bring them into the acute environment if it's not yeah. necessarily necessary yeah. i mean obviously if it's a there is a medical cause then that person might need to come in but um so this is just a summary really of our key yeah. points isn't it yeah. so fragile brains vulnerable to delirium so someone with dementia or frailty is is going to be much more likely to get a delirium um, timing is everything by that I think we mean timely assessment and intervention yeah. um, so don't 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 sort of scratch your head and 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 and, and think about this for too long um, if you can intervene do um, and I think the persistence of delirium at times is also really important so don't write someone off as having dementia because they may just have a, a persistent delirium mm -hmm. um, and 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 always remember the minor insults that can produce a delirium in some people thank you very much no i think that's really brilliant really great summary actually i think for for me the bit about preventing delirium sort of yeah. stood out that i don't think we often kind of do enough really um, Rob, any questions from you in the room? Any questions in the room or from the audience? I've got one more question actually. If I can, if I can yeah. still My yeah. other question, I think it is quite frightening. I had a patient last week who was quite traumatised actually. Um, you said mm. that there is a link between mm. sort of mm. PTSD. What, what's the best way to kind of just handle that really? What would you sort of say to that person? Because often what I find is that they're they're frightened about that mm. happening again mm. that they don't want to mm. take that medication or they don't mm. want to kind of yeah go back yeah. to the acute hospital what, yes. what sort yeah. of advice i mean our, our itu colleagues do this re really effectively because um it's a real problem sort of post-traumatic stress disorder after an itu stay um and they um they keep patient diaries so every patient has a notebook by their bed and every intervention that has happened to that person during the period of, of delirium is or of, of ITU is recorded so that what they then do is is revisit uh, that episode with the person and can go through and say we didn't take you down to the dungeon to torture you mm -hmm. we took you to the MRI scanner and you had an, a, an investigation so I think it's probably that being able to um, to go through um, with the person um, the, the sorts of things that are, have happened to them during their delirium yeah. and and what might be alternative explanations for theirs which are that terrible distressing torturous things have been going on um, and and then just sort of watching and waiting some people will obviously develop more prolonged um, sort of anxiety that might need to be dealt with differently yeah. okay no, I think it's really useful. I, when I first uh, spoke about the three Ds, I talked in terms of um, the differential diagnosis um, for depression in terms of thinking of excluding sort of drugs and alcohol as the symptoms. Could it be delirium? Mm -hmm. um, could it be depression? But I liked your, also your way of using the three Ds actually to look at the different, to think actually what are the features yeah, that differentiate absolutely. between um, yeah. dementia, between depression and between delirium, actually, I think it's really that's all whole, certainly, yeah, I like that. We carry that around with us. Yeah, it's useful yeah. just to have it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's clinical assessment that's key yeah. in this situation. Yeah. 
those screening tools will help, but it's it's just your clinical eye on the on the person. And as Jodie said several times, you know, taking a history and often taking a, a, a collateral history, so asking the loved one um, what's been going on. Yeah. No, well, thank you very much for coming to. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. I know it's been a really <laughs> useful um, webinar, and we look forward to the next webinar in the series. Thank you.